Our next speaker really uh, needs no introduction. Dr. Jorge Juncos is a, uh, a clinical professor of neurology at Emory University and, and a mentor, I would venture to say, to at least half of us here in the room. Um, Jorge approached me a couple months ago about this uh, next talk, which I think is going to be very interesting, about new scientific uh, um, ideas about how rehab efforts uh, can impact and improve the lives of uh, Parkinson's patients. So, Jorge uh, is here with uh, some members of his team to uh, go over some of those topics. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, good morning, and uh, I, I can't think, thanks for inviting me since I uh, sort of suggested the uh, presentation to the society, but I'm, I'm doing it uh, out of conviction and uh, the fact that I've been involved in this area. And I wanted to bring to your attention primarily the scientific evidence for what I'm going to be uh, saying today and also uh, come up with some recom recommendations. Uh, as a matter of disclosure, uh, in the last few months I joined the board of the uh, Parkinson Gladiators. They have a booth out there. And again, this uh, is uh, part of the work that I've done in the past and that led to this uh, collaboration. And I'm going to use this uh, as a as an anchor point, the Academy of Neurology recommendations, which are a little outdated. They were published in 2006. So I'm going to try to uh, carry you from 2006 to 2015, but using an evidence-based approach nonetheless. So, so we're not going to be talking about rehabilitation in uh, Parkinson's disease, because that's already been well established. The focus is going to be exercise, why exercise, what kind, what's the evidence, and uh, does it help uh, Parkinson's, just like Dr. Leitz was talking about recommendations in multiple sclerosis, in a way that's specific to the brain disorder, as opposed to simply uh, reducing secondary disability in a chronic neurologic condition. It's like saying, uh, sure, I mean, we're going to recommend that everybody exercise uh, because it's, it's good for you. Well, there's a number of rehabilitation techniques that have been used to target these symptoms in, in Parkinson's disease in particular, and there's good evidence, scientific evidence, from the rehabilitation community that these work. The problem is that uh, rehabilitation is approved for six weeks out of the year by most insurance programs, and the question is, what do you do after that? We know that not only does it work, but if you um, stop doing it, you will lose some of the effects over a period of time. So we need to find ways of uh, extending that benefit and making it uh, permanent, if at all possible, by adapting the, uh, the modalities in such a way that they can themselves adapt to the different stages of disease, including non-ambulatory stages. So these are the uh, list of uh, targets that uh, that are addressed with rehabilitation, and I must add also with exercise, uh, prevention of secondary disability, arrest of osteoporosis, improved cognitive function. I must say that like in MS, like in Parkinson's disease, a great deal of this work has been done in Alzheimer's disease as well for the purpose of improving cognitive function and maintaining cognitive function. And as you will see, they're probably a little bit further ahead than we are. But we will take that knowledge because in Parkinson's disease, we want to improve and maintain motor function, but we're not going to forget about cognitive function either. So improve sleep, huge decreased constipation, decreased fatigue, improve functional motor performance, improve drug efficacy. And there's actually evidence for all of these. And I'll touch on some uh, uh, major points there. These slides, by the way, were borrowed by, from uh, Patricia Creel, who's in the audience, uh, these first few slides here. And uh, to summarize physical therapy where everything is converging is on the big therapy, which is intense amplitude training, just like loud therapy for voice, for which there's ample evidence that it works, and I highly recommend it to patients. The big therapy also works in Parkinson's disease, and it's a starting point for most patients. Part of the discussion now is that when should you be recommending this? Uh, when the patient begins to fall and starts losing balance? Or do you want to intervene with such therapy at the very beginning? And as you'll see, we're coming to a change in paradigm that I'll uh, 
share with you at the end. But again, very good uh, double blind placebo control uh, evidence that this does work in Parkinson patients. And again, the problem is how do you maintain this? Uh, the other uh, key word here is intense, intense. Many of the studies uh, that uh, have been done in Parkinson's disease that you will uh, see sort of require that the interventions have some kind of intensity in order for it to be effective. What we don't know is what that threshold of intensity is in order to get a central nervous system effect, which is what we want. We know that any exercise is better than no exercise, but we're talking about brain effects of exercise and uh, intensity here appears to then become important. Uh, the evidence for physical therapy, there has been very, uh, very many systemic reviews that I'm not going to go into here, and meta-analysis studies that show positive effect of PT. And then uh, there's also evidence that there's many forms of exercise uh, that can help Parkinson's disease, Tai Chi, boxing, tango, tandem biking, treadmill training, pole walking, stretching, resistance training is not there. So it seems like just about every kind uh, of legitimate exercise where you get an aerobic workout uh, will help Parkinson's symptoms. When you have so many helping you, you start wondering is this kind of like a major placebo effect and that's why you want to, uh, not to knock placebo effect, I'll take it. If it as long as you show me a 40% effect, I'll take it. And all that means is that we're not clever enough to, to understand the mechanism. And that is true about many of the uh, complementary and alternative uh, uh, interventions that we have today. So I'm going to start with the Academy of Neurology as we move into exercise, not, not, uh, not uh, physical therapy. And we're going to use the same basis of class A, class B, class C. So uh, two consistent class one studies. So these are randomized control studies. And you're familiar with these, one randomized control study or two consistent class two studies, et cetera. So um, I will be referring to this uh, throughout the lecture. So the questions I will tackle very quickly, what is the evidence that exercise is specifically beneficial to Parkinson's disease? Is the, view any, is the view any different from simply a general recommendation to the population? And insurance companies are going to want to know that. If we're going to start paying for this, you need to show me that this is any better than, you know, where everybody sitting in this audience should be exercising. Why would that be any different? And, and what is the evidence that the brain itself is being affected? So according to the academy, they, they found out that these therapies uh, have some class C evidence for uh, beneficial effect in Parkinson's disease, chiropractic manipulation, osteopathy, and they threw exercise therapy down the line there and sure, that and uh, um, throw everything else in there. So although they admitted that there's suggestive evidence, they really did not harp on it. Uh, they are now working, the academy is now working on new guidelines and we're hoping that they will update the, uh, the guidelines in the way that I'm going to show you today. So um, uh, let's see here. OK. So basically, let me look at uh, non-pharmacologic therapies. And I'm going to uh, just show you highlights of the ones that were considered in the academy. They do a search of the literature. They look at everything that's uh, randomized uh, control studies. And they came up with a series of, uh, of studies that were published that use various uh, outcome measures. But the primary one is the United Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is the one that we use in pharmacologic studies of Parkinson's, where we're testing a drug. Now, uh, we don't know if this is the ideal uh, tool for measuring the effects of exercise in Parkinson patients. And as I'll show you later, it may very well not be. So it was designed for a different purpose in a different era. It's still our gold standard, so we use it for everything. Uh, and uh, then you have other scales here that attempt to incorporate some more objective outcomes of motor performance beyond simply the UPDRS. But as you can see here, most of them are using UPDRS, balance, false, strength. I would say that rather than false, we need to start powering studies for near false 
You don't want to have so many hip fractures as your outcome measure. Um, and the interventions are lasting relatively short periods of time, which is really not enough. You're not going to get a change in the system, certainly not a central nervous system change, during such short periods of time, the main reason for which is that in a patient with Parkinson's disease, there's a learning curve that is far steeper than in the general population. So much of what you're measuring during these three weeks, or three times three weeks, times four weeks, or 10 weeks, and so forth, is a learning curve. So you're proposing an intervention, you're proposing a dose, but what you're showing me in the results is that you're showing me a learning curve. So you're measuring outcomes throughout the learning curve. Once you establish a dose, that is that the patient has learned the intervention, then you, you start talking, and then from that point on, the intervention lasted uh, for so many weeks. So this is the conclusion that the academy came, came up with. Exercise may be considered to improve function, level C evidence, that results in improvement in UPDRS, uh, can be measuring UPDRS, but as I mentioned, not sure that's the right outcome. There's a decrease in falls, and I mentioned near falls is probably a better outcome. There's no specific exercise program that was shown to be superior to another, although even in this review, they're already indicating that that intensity of exercise is probably important, that just looking pretty as you push clouds or, or uh, or, or breathe deeply and so forth is probably not enough, that you have to uh, some way break out of sweat. Uh, no manual therapy was shown to be effective. Uh, that includes uh, massage therapy, but as I'll show you in, the mo in a moment, that's no longer true. And no treatment was shown to be protective, but again, those, those interventions were not meant to be neuroprotective because in four weeks, you're not gonna see a protective effect even in 12 weeks or six months. Mm. So this is where we were up to 2006. And then these other interventions came to, uh, came to bear. And uh, there's been a lot more work that has been done in these older interventions that have been around for some time. So we're gonna try to bring you up to speed. I'm gonna start with one that we did here at Emory. And this was uh, presented at the Academy of Neurology in 2009. And it's a study that we did comparing Qigong, Tai Chi, and aerobic exercise over the course of um, four months. So uh, what we meant to control in terms of the dose response is the pulse rate. So the intent was to use Qigong as a meditation in stillness, Tai Chi as meditation in movement with a level of intensity that would be intermediate between this and aerobic exercise, which was a walk-run exercise program done by rehabilitation professionals. And these are professionals that actually would chase the patient in the, in the track to make sure that they were keeping up with the, uh, with the uh, pulse rate activation that they wanted to see. In the case of Tai Chi, I will challenge you, anyone, except perhaps Mr. Wells is here, to have a Tai Chi master uh, keep track of the pulse rate on the people in the, uh, and it was virtually impossible. We went through, through three, and uh, there was no way that they were gonna accept from me how to teach uh, Tai Chi, or from me tell them what to do in their class. So that's sort of a, a little bit of a communication issue that turned out to be very important because we never were able to achieve the exercise intensity that we wanted in the Tai Chi group. And this probably has uh, a lot to do with the results. These were four month intervention. The first thing we learned by grading, having the teachers at least they managed to do this much, give them a grade for how well they uh, understood the intervention. Most of them got C minuses to D. We had a couple of Bs. So meaning that even during those four weeks, they did not learn it sufficiently well for them to have been able to say, this person was clearly <clears throat> and that is a function of, uh, we didn't select patients out. Uh, we just recruited them from the clinic and also the uh, motivating effect that the teacher had on the class. They were more concerned about avoiding falls and liability than they were with the intervention. <clears throat> and that became sort of inevitable. So what we saw here, if we look at the UPDRS, is that if we, uh, 
we look at the UPDRS before in green and after that there was not much of an effect. But in fairness to Qigong and Tai Chi in particular, they were barely learning it. So that in terms of controlling for the dose effect, maybe four months is not enough. And the intensity of the exercise, if we're going to be looking at intensity as a major variable, was not achieved. When we look at activities of daily living, uh, it turns out that the group that improved the most was the group that was doing the meditation in stillness. Again, evidence that meditation in stillness and learning how to breathe and relaxation therapy with Dr. Ron Milestone, who's a pediatrician who's been a lifelong meditator, that group really got into it and really learned a lot. But the other two groups were not doing sufficiently intense exercise to really show an effect. However, if we look for trends, so statistically you can start looking for trends uh, in, in this case <coughs> as to uh, improvement in activities of daily living. There is a trend that the uh, aerobic group tended to improve a little bit more than the others, but it did not achieve statistical significance. You see the p-value here. If we look at a general uh, global impression of change, uh, again, there's a trend for aerobic exercise to be better than Tai Chi, to be better than Qigong. <clears throat> and, and this is by the patient, sort of a tendency to improve. And again, by the investigator who was blind to the interventions, I was not participating at all. There is a trend here, again, for aerobic exercise to be a little bit better, but it barely gets there. And as you can see here, the difference is not huge, but it does achieve a trend towards significance. So again, even with four-week intervention, we're seeing that we can pick up a signal, but that signal needs to be more robust to widely disseminate this. Well, it turns out that that signal did come from a longer study that lasted six months. It was done in Boston. And this is a paper in the New England Journal that was published in 2012, where they showed that the patient significantly improved from baseline to six months in outcome measures that were a little bit different than the ones that we use. So uh, time up and go, you saw that an improvement uh, there that was significant. The UPDRS, they paid much more attention to the intensity of the exercise. The duration of the exercise was six months and a much more motivating um, instructor. And you can see that the improvement, even in the motor scores, which is at part three, were significant. But equally important is that they were including a series of other outcome measures that are not part of the UPDRS, which again corroborate the fact that these interventions are effective. So they're looking at uh, uh, maximum excursion, directional control, so sl uh, stride length, gait velocity, peak torque extension, et cetera, and show that all of these that are barely perceptible at the level of the UPDRS were effective, and the, and the impression is by looking at activities of daily living is that these things carry meaning, they're clinically important, and they're not rehabilitation gook. that the, these are things that are important, and it shows us that our normal clinical tool for measuring change in pharmacologic studies of Parkinson's disease, treating with LDOP, et cetera, may not be the ideal ones to achieve this goal. You can see here that the quality of life tool is, um, is not sufficient, for instance, in that if you look at the, the total PDQ39, it is not statistically significant. If you break it down by mobility and activities of daily living, then it begins to show a little bit of significance, but the tool itself is not validated to pick and choose uh, one item. You have to look at it as a whole, and that's the only way that it's been validated. But it gives you a glimpse of hope that, that perhaps uh, these tools could be in, in, improved to uh, improve that signal detection. There are multiple others. This is one that I served uh, as an advisor by uh, Frank Skidmore, who was in Gainesville uh, some years ago, Florida, and is now at University of Alabama. And he was looking specifically at treadmill with the intent that treadmill has a dual effect of being aerobic, you can control the dose by controlling the, the, uh, the angle and the speed of the treadmill. So it's a much better tool for controlling dose response than 
teaching Tai Chi or how to breathe. And what he did find that uh, the patient improved cardiovascular fitness, they improved locomotor activity by 27% uh, and improved UPDRS score. But in 17% that, uh, so it's almost a fifth of the patient, <coughs> they did not achieve any benefit at all. In spite of the fact that he had control for the speed and the intensity, and 7% of them uh, developed a hypotension that was significant during the trial. Again, illustrating the fact that although we're focusing here on the importance of intensity, you have to remember that we're neurologists, that there's a lot of internal medicine, drug therapy issues that would also have to be taken into account. And those are the kinds of things that we'd like to delegate to the internist and have the patient at least run it by the internist, as they would for any other kind of uh, physical intervention. And also for you to be mindful of the fact that patients with Parkinson's have some degree of autonomic dysfunction and that every drug that we give them for treating motor symptoms will gradually drop their blood pressure. So that uh, we can never forget that because you have a couple of syncopes in your class and, and you know, that's going to be a major setback. So this is a study that we did moving from, from exercise itself to, uh, to massage therapy. This is with the Atlanta School of Massage and we published this a few years ago back in 2006. So just as the guidelines were being published, so this was not included. And what we showed, this is uh, part one of the UPDRS, part two and part three. So this is activities of daily living, motor function. And we showed a hugely statistically significant uh, effect of exercise therapy. So not only were they feeling better, which you would expect from the exercise therapy, but they were actually performing better. And uh, this is too small to read, but the point here is that this was checked at two points, one week and four weeks after the last massage intervention, which was provided twice a week by uh, one of the senior uh, students under the supervision of the professors at the Atlanta School of Massage. And although the statistical significance begins to wane, it remains statistically significant even a month after the last intervention. So massage therapy, not only do the, you the feel good, but you actually perform better. And I think that that may be underutilized in, in Parkinson's disease. Again, it's mostly not covered by insurance, so it's an issue of affordability. So uh, the effectiveness of exercise intervention for people with Parkinson's disease had been looked at a couple of years after the Academy uh, guidelines. And this really summarizes uh, the state of knowledge uh, very close to today's point, and it's an excellent uh, review that I would recommend. And I'm just going to give you sort of a visual impression of it. This is the standardized mean differences from zero, which is baseline, and then after the intervention. <laughs> And we have here a series of outcome measures, including the UPDRS. You can see here in 1994, Cindy Camella did a study of aerobic exercise for four weeks looking at the UPDRS, barely noticed. So that was very comparable to what we, we had shown. However, there have been other studies with Ellis in particular here in the uh, Bridgewater looking at the UPDRS. And in this case, uh, another outcome measure that more incorporates motor and activities of daily living function, almost like using the part two and part three together. Oh, uh, yeah, I forget that I, I can't walk away from the microphone here. I apologize. <clears throat> and what you can see is that there is an effect size that you can measure. And uh, so it's about one standard deviation from the baseline score. And this, uh, but if you take all of the studies that were reviewed as a whole, you see that it's about a 0.5 standard deviation from the mean. So again, it still achieves statistical significance, but it's not a huge effect. And these exercises are four weeks, six weeks, 16 weeks, 22 weeks. So even a half a year was barely enough, again, using those tools to pick out the difference. And again, we're trying to make the point that these tools may barely scratch the surface. And again, if you look at several other studies here and what you're seeing is much of the same here. And again, that's particularly true when you switch to the PDQ, 
which is a Parkinson's disease quality of life. So for some reason, I'm not going to go into it, the quality of life tool seems to be even worse than the, uh, the uh, Parkinson's disease rating scale. Uh, so how can exercise affect the brain? So let's look a little bit at studies in, in, in aging. Well, uh, what we know in Parkinson's disease, starting with the periphery and then moving back to the brain, but the periphery controlled by the brain, it's at looking at motor unit activation. And this is a, a normal motor unit activation when you have an EMG needle doing a, a predefined task like moving your wrist. And you get these crisp bursts of motor neurons that you can measure. And this is a patient with Parkinson's disease with crispness of activation of motor neurons is uh, long gone. In experimental models, but not in patients with Parkinson's disease, it can be shown that exercise can move you from this to this. So you're getting a crisper um, motor unit activation profile that requires less energy to get you moving and going. And to the extent that this burst is broad, there's more energy invested into doing the same task. And it may contribute to some of the fatigue that we see in Parkinson's. Um, Jay Alberts, who used to be at Georgia Tech, worked with us. I'm not going to go into the details uh, because this is still not uniformly uh, accepted. But he showed back in 2011 that acute forced exercise, but not voluntary, improved brain activation uh, to a degree similar to medications. So these are tandem bicycle where the patient is not allowed to pedal at his own rate. He is being forced to pedal at a, cer a certain rate that the intervention requires and demands. And only when you do that do you get activation patterns that are comparable post-exercise and on medication. I realize that you're not going to see the details of that, but take my word for it. This has not been widely accepted yet, but it's, it begins to hint that not only are we affecting motor units to make the activation a little more uh, crisp and closer to normal, but you're also affecting brain function. And when you start uh, looking at what are other people doing in this uh, field, and what you see is that not only are you improving motor function, perhaps brain activation patterns, but if you start looking at the aging hippocampus with the volume of which tends to decrease, over a period of time, and you start uh, looking at levels of neurotrophic factors, in this uh, case, BDNF, you start seeing that uh, as you age and the hippocampus gets smaller, you also have decreased levels of circulating uh, neurotrophic factors. And what they uh, were able to do, and this is again uh, both in plasma, and I'll show you in a minute, but also in animal models, is that you can control that age-related decay and, and neurotrophic factors by simply exercising and, again, vigorously. So voluntary exercise may engage proteasome function to benefit the brain after trauma. So this is a different model where you're looking at recovery from trauma, and then you're exercising or not exercising. And, uh, and this, this study here was done in, in animals. Uh, that were given a mild concussion, and then you're able to track the, both the inflammatory changes, and in this case, the changes in proteasomal function, and the carbonyl component of it tends to uh, decrease as a function of exercise, and, the, and this is a uh, carbonyl component that goes up during trauma, and then with exercise, it's brought down, and this is a, a different uh, a compound. But in general, what we, the take home message of this is that um, protosomal activity that's associated with poor function with exercise comes down, and proteosomal function that is associated with repair, recovery, and uh, healthy tissue protein synthesis tends to go up. Again, measuring the effects on brain of physical exercise in an animal model. So going into animal models of Parkinson's disease, uh, Dr. Michael Sigmund has the University of Pittsburgh uh, has done a series of exercises, again, only in animals, 
uh, that have been exercised at different levels of intensity. And the conclusion from the exercise, if we can um, concentrate here, is that in these animal models, he has affirmed that physical exercise can reduce behavioral and neurobiological deficits induced by, in this case, we're moving from trauma to MPTP, which causes the death of dopamine neurons. So the recovery from this insult and suggests that neuroprotective effects are likely to involve activation of signaling cascades by neurotrophic factors, such as glial cell-derived uh, neurotrophic factor. So he's not only measured the dopamine content, the rate at which dopamine neurons are lost after MPTP, but he's also measuring these uh, neurotrophic factors as of one factor that may be involved in that recovery. This is a summary of the studies that have been done that gives you sort of the bottom line. And we have evidence in animal models of Parkinson's disease of what? We have evidence of improved glucose utilization. We have improved the immune system, suppress oxidative state, stabilizes calcium homeostasis, reduces inflammation, improved mitochondrial function, increased growth factors in neurotransmitter. Most of this is in experimental animals, granted, but some of these experimental animal models are models of dopamine loss in Parkinson's disease, so they are relevant to, to what we're talking about. So this is sort of the beginning of the, uh, of the evidence. So there's one here. These two are separate studies. This is exercise-induced neuroprotection of hippocampal neurons and the levels of APP and PS1 in transgenic mice by upregulation of mitochondrial function and DNA glycosylase in the brain of rats who are being exercised. This would be more relevant to Alzheimer's disease, but we'll take any cognitive sparing that we can get with the same intervention. More relevant to Parkinson's is uh, dopamine-mediated behaviors, and in this case, they're measuring the tendency of uh, mice who are given MPTP to fall off a, a ledge that when they're challenged, and that this measures the amount of time that it takes to fall off the ledge. So this is uh, after sailing, and then after uh, sailing and exercise, and, and then uh, it's done again sailing and sailing after exercise with MPTP. And basically what you see is that that uh, with exercise, this curve gets to be much more robust, and they're able to stay on the ledge uh, for a longer period of time, whether it's in the natural state or after MPTP. They can't reach normal after MPTP, but there's a significant improvement with exercise nonetheless, even after the injections of MPTP. So from a functional standpoint, you can see recovery with exercise there. Now, the important thing of this article, again, by the group by Sigmund, and University of Pittsburgh is that the, they have been able to demonstrate using treadmill exercise in the rat that the recovery is dependent on the, on the intensity of the exercise. So that if you just have the, uh, the uh, little rats go on the treadmill for a leisure Sunday walk, that may not be enough. But to the extent that you exercise them uh, with more vigorous intensity, whoops, oh, and I don't want to. Uh, the, uh, the recovery is much more robust and easier to measure, as you see here. This is uh, low exercise intensity, middle exercise intensity, and even at this level, which is sort of a sub-maximal exercise for patients with elderly patients, you start seeing an effect, and then you see the maximum effect at high intensity. This may not be possible in humans, but this is achievable, and you see a dose response effect in neuroprotection in, in Parkinson's. Now, this lab also has been measuring these, uh, these, uh, these effects at the cellular level, looking at the number of Th-positive cells left after uh, exercise in the MPTP model of Parkinsonism. And as you can see here, these are the sedentary animals, the ones in these little circles here. And these are the animals that were exercised at the level that I showed you before. And what he finds is that the number of cells left after the MPTP insult actually increases in those animals that have been exercised. And he's also postulating here as they measure the elevation in GDNF level 
in those animals that they are actually mechanisms at the, at the level of intracellular signaling that are probably responsible for the sparing of these neurons and the recovery of these neurons and their resistance to insult. Again, not a perfect model of Parkinson's disease, but it begins to hone down the message of the basic science to the dopamine neurons. Uh, this is an excellent review of all these mechanisms brought together, the whole list that I told you. It's an excellent review that I recommend on uh, how do we put all of this together? How is this affecting the brain? One big question that remains is that how does pedaling ultimately affect the brain? And uh, the honest answer that we still don't know, but with that it does affect the brain is, is hugely evidence based on the on the reports that I'm showing you here, but we do not have the connection. It's probably going to turn out to be transsynaptic effects, endocrine effects. Uh, so let's go get back to uh, man. And this is another uh, review that I would recommend. It brings the academy back to 2012, and it looks at meta-analysis of multiple studies that have been looking at exercise versus control. This is aerobic. This is dance versus control much of which was by Madeline Hackney, who's now uh, in, in the faculty at Emory in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, queuing martial arts, and uh, this is the total. And what you're seeing here is that there's a high variability on both the intensity and the duration of the intervention, so that you look at a meta-analysis, although the, in general there's an improvement, this is change in, in the uh, in the baseline score by five points. And what you can see here is that there is an improvement. These are uh, normalized scores for the differences in the um, outcome measures. There is an effect, but it's not huge. And that's because you're not paying close attention to the, um, to the variables that I mentioned, duration. And there's a change in, in, uh, in lifestyle that needs to occur with these interventions if you're expecting this to la last for the duration of the illness. It's not a six-week uh, physical therapy anymore. And there's a whole host of other measures that we use in, in Parkinson's disease that, as I showed you before, are probably relevant in that if we look at from, the, this is data from the meta-analysis, the uh, Variables that became the most important are things from turn duration, stride velocity, peak arm speed. All of these are highly significant. The UPDRS activities of daily living is significant, but notice that the UPDRS itself was not significant. And this, there are studies that were carried out right through 12. So again, one of the other things to keep in mind that we may be using the wrong tools if we're only relying on the UPDRS and we have to find ways of incorporating some of these other outcomes moving forward. So the conclusion is that long-term exercise studies in, in PD, this is from my own experience, and so I have a huge uh, attrition rate, 28%, about a third of the patients. So groups like Parkinson's uh, gladiators in the booth that's out there, and I reveal at the beginning that I'm part of the board, are trying to get at the issue then, unless you stay with it, you're going to lose the effect. And one thing that we're lacking right now is mechanisms to make sure that the patient stays with it because so that the benefit can be sustained over a long period of time. And that requires your participation as a, as a neurologic society in that as the community groups that are nonprofit start making strides and making these, uh, these exercise programs and this rehabilitation uh, assessments available to the community on their own that we do our part and refer patients to these facilities so that they can survive. They're, they're really emphasizing the cost effectiveness of it. I think that I'm throwing behind some evidence of both in humans and in uh, experimental models that the, the effect is not just a placebo effect. It's not solely because they feel better, they look better, which is nothing to sneeze at. And, but there's also good evidence that there's a specific benefit to patients with Parkinson's disease. Tai Chi has a steeper learning curve, so it may take a little bit longer to see their results, but they're well worth it in terms of improvement and balance. And even things like meditation can have a benefit, although it's more difficult to, uh, to gauge exactly what they're affecting. 
Now, the final thing is that in the studies that have shown that some of these more complex interventions have not seen an effect, we have to keep in mind that these interventions are not really true, because what we're doing, is we're measuring learning curves rather than the intervention, because it takes a, a, a little bit, in, especially in Parkinson patients, to be able to overcome the initial inertia. So future research, the development of methods to identify pre-symptomatic patients to begin as soon as possible to see if the time of the intervention is critical. If you wait till they are stage three, is that too late to maximize the benefits of the exercise? We're beginning to contend that the earlier you start, the, the more likely you are to extend the life of those initial stages of Parkinson's disease. Innovative trials with uh, long-term follow-up and new tools for measuring the effect, and studies that demonstrate both effectiveness, possibly neuroprotective effect, and I would say also cost effectiveness. So, so this is a, I mean, oops, this is supposed to be, so this is a change in paradigm that, that we would like to propose that rather than keep like the academy have exercise therapy down here someplace, that as soon as the diagnosis is made, that you get either a physical consult that leads to an engagement in physical therapy from the very beginning, as opposed to waiting till they are beginning to show signs of gait and balance. And again, that's a shift in paradigm as opposed to waiting till the problems occur to start doing it earlier. I'm not gonna talk about these other uh, treatments here. And this is the group that's out there. So again, to summarize, uh, <clears throat> this is a community group that is trying to uh, provide that piece that follows a talk such as this, which is okay, so that's very nice, but how am I gonna do this? Who do I talk to? Where do I refer my patients? Uh, these are community groups that have shown their commitment by being able to survive on their own and what they're asking at this point is to help them survive and meet the mission by simply having you keep in mind the importance of exercise to every neurologic condition. You saw from the previous talk for MS, I gave you a little glimpse that the Alzheimer's community has been on board with this for, for a long time, and now the Parkinson community is accumulating evidence to, to show that this is important to in Parkinson. And it remains for us to demonstrate what the mechanism is for this connection. So for those patients who are not able to exercise, that we can perhaps still provide some of this benefit. Thanks very much for your attention.